ก็เป็นไงบ้างครับตอนขึ้นเบรกเช้าก็หลังมาสาหัสนะครับพายุเขาเป็นไงบ้างถามความความรู้สึกก่อนรู้สึกรู้สึกไงครับว่าตามทันไหมหรือว่าเร็วไปไหมหรือช้าไปไหมหรือมีคําถามตรงไหนไม่ไม่นี่คือเพื่อนของผมจะได้บอกเขาไปอาร์ตให้เขาปรับจังหวะการพูดเขาให้ให้ตรงกับเราเขาเนื่องจากเป็นภาษาอังกฤษด้วยแล้วก็กลัวว่าจะจะไม่เข้าใจกันคืออย่างน้อยๆคือสักห้าสิบเปอร์เซ็นต์อ่ะเขาอยากอยากให้เข้าใจสักท่านเนื้อหาสักห้าสิบเปอร์เซ็นต์ไปอะไรอย่างเงี้ยนะครับแต่ว่ากลัวว่าจะพูดยากไปอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคือคือเนื้อหาเป็นไงบ้างครับถามก่อนถามเฟรนี่ก่อนตาดีโอเคแล้วคุณเล่นอยู่ต่ออยู่คนเดียวนะนี่คุณอ่ะเขาอยู่บ้างไงเขาอยู่เขาไหนรู้สึกเนื้อหาเป็นไงบ้างครับโอเคไหมคือคือฟังง่ายไปไหมหรือว่าง่ายเลยไหมคือต้องถามก่อนเพราะว่าบางทีเขรู้แล้วรู้อยู่แล้วอะไรอย่างเงี้ยนะครับก็ต้องถามก่อนเนื้อหาแบบไม่ยากแล้วก็หรือยากไปไหมหรือตั้งแต่เช้ามาไม่รู้ขึ้นอะไรกันมีแซวเล่นนะโอเคก็ไม่เป็นไรครับท่านที่เดาเพื่อเพื่อเพื่อจะลดในการรับฟังนะครับก็เราจะมีคุณเศรษฐกิจนะครับคุณนศจะมาช่วยนะครับในการสมมติว่าถ้ามีคําถามคำถามเนี่ยไม่สนคือสงสัยไม่เข้าใจนะครับอยากถามคุณโทบิอาสก็แต่พูดสังเกตไม่ได้นะครับไม่ไม่แข็งแรงก็ฝากให้คุณโทษถามให้นะครับสีชื่อโน้ตนะผมชื่อโน้ตนะคือเดินวงกันเล่นน้อยนะชื่อโน้ตกับชื่อโน้ตนะครับเดินวงกันเล่นน้อยนะโอเคก็ไม่เป็นไรถ้าเกิดมีคำถามนะแล้วช่วงไหนที่คุณโทบิอาสมีคําถามพวกเรานะครับแล้วคุณโทบิอาสจะโยนคำถามบางทีอยากจะให้คุณโน้ตช่วยแปลภาษาไทยแล้วให้พวกเราเนี่ยมีเขาเรียกมีส่วนร่วมนะครับในในในกิจกรรมมากขึ้นเนาะอ่ะงั้นถ้าไม่ยากส่งขอยาส่งให้คุณชมยาสอนเลยสิขอบคุณและขอบคุณมากไม่ได้เข้าใจที่เขาพูดแต่ฉันหวังว่าคุณไม่รู้สึกเหมือนเมื่อฉันพูดเมื่อฉันพูดดังนั้นถ้าคุณมีคำถามคุณสามารถถามโน้ตและบางทีอาจจะช่วยให้เขาพูดหรือแม้แต่สองสามคำถามด้วยกันถ้าคุณรู้สึกไม่สบายกับสิ่งที่ผมพูดหรือแม้แต่คุณคิดว่านี่คือจริงๆคุณสามารถถามผมและผมจะยินดีที่จะทำงานกับคุณในช่วงเวลาที่คุณต้องการการทำงานเพราะฉะนั้นผมไม่สามารถทำได้ทุกอย่างที่คุณต้องการ Actually, before I start in the break, in the break, I noticed um, you have something great here in Thailand, and that is uh, you have we have four female security experts in the room, which is amazing, which is great. So I hope uh, maybe you want to bring your colleagues, or I hope you find this interesting. And also, uh, in case you are you like this, uh, in case you like OWASP, we have a program that's called Women in AppSec, and um, that allows um, it's like a scholarship. We have uh, AppSec conferences every year, and um, for each of the conferences, for example, we had one this year in Tokyo. And we uh, offer one woman to go there. Um, travel expenses, conference ticket, training, all paid. Okay. So if you, for example, this this spring, um, a lady in Japan won this uh, contest. So you just the only thing you have to do is submit your uh, like, like your name and why you like why you work in application security. And uh, you can basically go there, including flight and everything, flight and hotel and so on. So if you find this interesting, or if you have a friend who you think would like to work in application security or just finish their study, um, I think the next uh, EPSEC conference will be end of next year, so in one year. But I hope that Kittisak will post uh, the program in time on your website when it's coming. So please feel free to apply when it when we open again, and of course uh, join the Ombos community anyway. You know, it's <laughs> I think these are nice guys even with without uh, flying to another country. Um, good. Okay. Sorry. A uh, small digression. Oh, the same is true, of course, for you guys. If you have a nice colleague, um, a female colleague who would be interested in application security, let them know. 
because we really like to uh, widen our community. And there are very many very smart women out there, trust me. Maybe smarter than you guys. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe, maybe I should excuse myself for talking so long before about SQL injection. Um, the reason is it is, I said it's so easy to fix, but it's still so common to see. And there's, it, it's a very dangerous problem. So I hope if you go out today, and if you can only, only do one thing, if you can avoid SQL injection problems, uh, this day would be a big win already. Um, I have two more hours, so one hour now, then we have lunch, and then we have one more hour, and then we have the panel discussion. Um, what I'm going to do is the first half of this hour, of, I will talk more about application security, and then we move into mobile security more. Um, actually, the difference between application security and mobile security is not big. Because in the end, what is this? This is a mobile, but this is nothing else than a computer. Okay? This mobile has more commuting power than my computer like eight years ago. So this is just a computer. It just looks different. Okay? So the same is true for your applications. So you can have SQL injection on a mobile in the back end in your system. So everything I say now applies to mobile equally, okay? So this is like a, a foundation and then we go into some more mobile specific topics. Um, yeah, so when, whenever you look at a smartphone, don't see it as a separate device. Just see it as a different type of screen. That's the only difference you have, actually. Okay, so um, I see many more people came to the front, so uh, I hope that's a good sign, and that's a sign that I'm not too dangerous for you. Or maybe it's just a sign that some people would like some chocolate before lunch. So that would be good too. Um, and I love, by the way, this is, this is like, I think, Swiss or German chocolate, so, uh, yeah. Um, who knows, starting with the question right away, who knows what cross-site scripting is? Uh, maybe someone else instead. I, 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 oh, yeah, okay. By the way, you can also answer in Thai, okay? If you feel more comfortable speaking in Thai, you can answer in Thai. Okay, go for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, cross-site scripting is a uh, vulnerability on the server side which uh, the developer doesn't filter the output that brings on the browser. That allows attacker to execute client-side scripting such as JavaScript, Flash on the browser of the victim. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. In, in a nutshell, really. Very concise. Um, how does it work? How do you launch a cross-site scripting attack? Practically. Okay, one more. Let's <laughs> <laughs> from here. Okay, no. Why are you laughing? It's fine. It's perfect. <laughs> Our, we use the cross-site scripting <laughs> attack to either some command like a the document cookie from this page into the argument of the part on the URL. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm think, you know, I think maybe I think too simple, and you are too advanced, so that might be the challenge. Um, you're right. Okay, you're right. Um, I wanted to start with one step below, and that is how do I how do I do this as an attacker? What do I do? And the, the way for me to, to launch a cross-site scripting attack is I look at stuff where I can post stuff on a website. So you have a form, you have a wiki, you have a, a forum where you can post comments, you have a blog. Uh, we live in this wonderful age of Web 2.0. Who has heard of this? Where everybody can contribute content. 
Unfortunately, it's not only content you can upload. You can also upload script. So for example, if you work in a company, many of the companies allow you to um, modify your own data. So for example, you can modify the address where you live, or uh, you can um, change your birthday or change your name if you marry or something. So there are many ways how you can upload content in, onto, a, onto an application. Uh, or for example, if you, if you go on holiday, afterwards maybe you submit uh, a comment about how the hotel was, whether there were nice people or so. And everybody else on the web will see that. So the challenge is, normally you would just upload text, and that's fine. But if you upload some text, and put some JavaScript in it, that can be very dangerous. Why? Because if I read the text, that's fine, but your browser automatically uh, executes JavaScript that it sees. So it, in theory, if I, own, if, it's, if I upload script and I see it, that's okay, because I'm, I'm kind of attacking myself. But if I upload script and then later you take a look at it, the browser will run the script in your context. And that means, for example, the browser can also automatically submit other requests. And they will then come from you. So suddenly, um, you send requests to an application server, for example, saying, well, I like, maybe you're surf surfing a holiday destination, and you think you're just reading the comments, but in truth, suddenly some attacker makes you buy a new holiday package and wants you to fly to Africa. Maybe it's a colleague who thinks you should really go, <laughs> who doesn't want you to, to be in the office or whatever, and sends you, wants to send you to Africa, uh, and then you have to pay something. Um, so, or he can, uh, or you can make, uh, or as an attacker, I could make you submit other comments. So, for example, you are on a website where you say, oh, Thailand is nice, and what is nice to do in Bangkok, and you, you take a look at this, and just by looking at it, the script runs, and it may send a message like, um, actually, let's use you, that's better. So it may, I may, I send this, you serve this and suddenly um, JavaScript runs and then it says not, not comments, oh, uh, this hotel is really bad or this is really great place and I always love to go drinking with my buddies and I'm always drunk and uh, please fire me at work or something, you know, tell my boss. So suddenly he's in trouble, okay? Because everybody on the net thinks he sent this, even though he didn't. Um, it's also quite interesting, you can launch like, um, so you can impersonate people, you can steal cookies by this. Uh, why is stealing a cookie a problem? By the way, what's a cookie? Let's go, very, I mean cookies, this is not a cookie, okay, this is chocolate. <laughs> chocolate, cookie. So, what's, what's a cookie in IT? No, you, you, you have some chocolate, okay? No, I, I really love chocolate. Yeah, okay. okay, let's see, what else? You already have a red one? Okay, you really love chocolate. But let's give another person a chance first. So, anybody wants to say what a cookie is? You can speak in Thai. Otherwise, he gets a chocolate, okay? That's your last chance. One, two, three, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's handy. Uh, the cookie is just like a, a form of a Czech language with used to identify the person. Just like to identify the database account, which is our, it's just like a form of a, like a secret coding with a good, I don't know how to explain it in a human language, but <laughs> that's, technically it's just like that. That, that. That's okay. That's okay. We're all techies. We're not really human, so don't worry. <laughs> um, you are half right. Let me try to put this in a more simple manner. I think you're just too smart. That's the problem. <laughs> um, 
as I said at the beginning, HTTP is stateless. So you don't know whether you're the same person who sends this request again. What you do is, actually about 15 years ago, somebody introduced a concept called cookie, which is part of an HTTP header. So it is sent in each HTTP request, it attaches a little bit of byte, a little bit of text with it. And that contains a token that can be just a random string, or it can contain some of your data. And that is submitted every time. And it's, this is like all the time you go and say, this is really me. So this is, this is how we keep state in HTTP at the moment. And per se, cookies are safe and are probably the best way to authenticate. So you have to make sure that you use uh, encrypted communication and that you set some cookie parameters correctly. But basically, cookies would be the authentication token you use. So, now you, you, you have that authentication token, that means anyone who has your cookie can claim he's you. So you need to be really careful not to lose it. And um, JavaScript, uh, cross-site scripting, is one of the ways to try to steal your cookie. Um, an easy or reasonable way to defend this is uh, to set in the cookie a parameter which is called HTTP only. If you set this in the cookie, it will never be exposed to JavaScript. It will only go to the server. Still there is some risk, okay, but this will help a little bit against the stealing. Um, let's go to JavaScript one more time. So. Uh, I, as an attacker, can upload some stuff, and then you download it. Um, I guess most of you know what HTML is. Let's see whether you know what does this I, what does this do. This is the easiest chocolate ever, and you not you 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 exploded from this one. What is this in HTML? Ask me. Hi. <laughs> You're colluding. <laughs> you tell him the answer so he gets the chocolate. I know. No, seriously. Other, but, but if you're not, you, I catch you. Sorry. This is open tag tag. Yes. It opens the HTML tag. Okay. It opens an HTML tag. Um, second question. What is this? Seen this before? Yeah. Don't talk in Thai, can I talk? She say that it's, it's the same as the previous one. Yes, it coded with. Yes, it is exactly the same set of character. It looks the same. Only this one does not open an HTML tag. This is only the character. This does not do anything. Okay. This basically brings you into HTML command language. With this, you open an HTML tag. With this, you just display the sign on your screen. So, if I'm an attacker, I send you maybe this. I send you a control sign. What you want to do when you, when you send this back to another user, you send this back. Because this is basically harmless. This is disarmed. This is just text, okay? So um, the key element is that when you receive data from a user, you first check whether there is any special control characters that you sh that shouldn't be there. Uh, like you couldn't sh check for this character. I mean, normally this shouldn't. No, sorry, not for this. Sorry. You can check, for example, whether this is part of a name. I think. If I'm submitting, for example, my name in a, in a contact form, uh, I think this wouldn't be part of a Thai name, or? 
No. I, I think Thailand's don't have this character. Oh? No. No, 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 we don't have That's it. good. That makes it easier. So you could actually, when you receive input from a user, you check whether this character is in it, and if yes, then you say, oh, there's some problem, you know, this is not a real name. Um, so first you check for it, and then if you, maybe there are some reasons why you have to accept it, then you code it in the other way. By the way, uh, there are other, many other characters as well that have control capabilities in HTML, as you most likely know. So there's like double quotation, single quotation, um, ampersand, uh, less than and, and, and greater than. So these are all um, control characters that you can use in HTML. Most of them would not necessarily be part of a string, but for example, if you live in Scotland, in England, there are people who are called O'Brien, okay? And they get really angry if there's no single quote after the O, because that's their name. So you cannot, you cannot tell them that, that they must not use this character, because this is part of their name, okay? So you have to allow this for some, for some input. That means maybe someone is sending this, it may be an attacker, but it may also be just a person whose name is O'Brien. And so what you need to do is you need to transfer it into the proper encoding here. So this is the, dis this is the dis disarmed value. Can you see? Yeah. My sh shadow of my hand? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so whenever you receive the single quotation mark, you change it. Sorry. You change it to this. Or if you want to encode it in Unicode, this would be this thing. Um, the same might be true. Some companies have a name like uh, Johnson and Johnson with an ampersand. In HTML, an ampersand is a control character. So, again, you may have to accept it. And then you have to return it with the proper encoding like this one, or in Unicode, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so in theory this sounds all easy. It's like you check the input and you encode the output. So whenever we, you receive a character that's kind of evil, you, you try to encode it in a proper way. Unfortunately, cross-site scripting is much more difficult than SQL injection. Let's jump to this. And the problem is the following. Um, if you have HTML, you actually have different HTML elements. So you have a body, uh, you have script elements, you have images, URLs, and so on. Including you can have JSON, um, cascading style sheets, and so on. And the challenge is you actually have to encode differently depending on in which element the data will later end up in. And that makes it a real headache. Okay? So, um, show you. So for example, if you do, uh, yeah. if you have a normal HTML body, uh, this would be an evil part. So this would be, for example, I open a script, uh, I send a script message, and then I close the script. Of course, an attacker would never send you this alert script because this is just to show this is evil, okay? Um, an attacker would do something silent, so you wouldn't even notice. Um, and then if you would want to properly encode just this little string here, this would be the proper encoding. So you open the bracket, this is the first bit, and you have script here, you close the bracket, alert, it's this here. Can you see that? No? Nothing? Okay. Um, yeah. So, so this would be encoding for HTML. This would be encoding for HTML attributes, which is a little bit different, as you may see. Or you have actually a URL. So if you have an href, in HTTP, uh, HTML, 
then you have again a slightly different encoding here. Um, so this makes it more complicated. Let me see how I do this. Oh yeah, uh, there's uh, there's some guys who kind of I mean there, there's different ways how you look at this. Um, you have input validation, so you check everything you receive, and output encoding. I would say the most important part is that you encode everything that you send back. Because by encoding, you disarm the, the script. You should, chill, you should still check everything you receive, whether it makes sense. So for example, if, if you have a field with a name, and if the name is suddenly 4,000 characters long, that's not a real name, most likely. I don't, I mean, maybe you have a very kind of honorary person who has a very long title, but I think even he might be struggling with a 4,000 character long title. So you should check whether the length is correct and whether it contains the right characters. Um, and I mean, there are some people who, for example, say, well, we also filter for the, the word script. So every time you submit script, um, we kind of say, oh, this is not, not okay. Um, this can help a little bit, but honestly, uh, blacklisting is not uh, sufficient. Because in many cases, I actually don't need to use that word to launch an attack. I can do that also without, and you will see in a minute. <coughs> Sorry. Um, OK, let's show you some HTML. So here, for example, you would have an attribute. And here you first, if, if I'm an attacker, this would be the data I want to submit. And it would later end up here. So, I, for example, there would be a form, I submit my data, and later it's played back here. So it could be, for example, maybe you want to uh, have a different color or something. And instead of that, I close the tag, I open a new tag, have script, and then something bad happens. If you think about it, to some degree it's actually a little bit like SQL injection before. You go out of a normal data layer and into a programming and back. So it, it, there is a certain similarity to this. I'm not sure whether you can follow that analogy. Um, and I said you don't necessarily need to have the, the term script. For example, if you have an href, you can actually have a, something, an action on click, and then you don't even need the script uh, value to go there. Or if you think, well, we just protect for this smaller and greater sign, well, bingo. Uh, if I'm already inside the frame uh, attribute here, I actually don't even need to break out of the HTML uh, tag. So. If you just filter for the smaller and greater character, no problem. I don't need it here. Okay, so I can actually launch an attack even without these characters. So if you if you just filter for something, that's not saving your day. Definitely not. Or here is just an expression. <coughs> And of course, if you're in JSON, well, you have a lot of flexibility anyway. Um, good, so how do you fix this problem? I mean, this is a little bit of a pain. Um, in, as we are talking about Java today, actually in .NET, this would be reasonably easy because there is encoding functions in .NET for the different uh, HTML uh, tags. Unfortunately, the basic Java um, API does not have that, to my knowledge. So some frameworks do, uh, but ba basic Java doesn't give you like uh, encode for HTML body or something. So um, you can write your own, but writing your own is first of all a lot of work, and I think, uh, well, I'm lazy, so I try not to work, but I can help it. Um, so what you can do is we actually have a project at, uh, at OWASP which is called the OWASP Java Encoder Project. Let me see. Yeah. And that's, that's quite, quite recent. Actually, let me jump into this. Yeah. So here you see it's, it's a small library that you can use. 
You can write that yourself too, okay? It's, it's no big deal. So it's quite easy to make it, but I mean, it's already there, so. Um, and what you do is, instead of just giving back the, the text, so the text is basically what you have in your, in your application. It's what the user gave you. And instead of putting it directly into this, uh, into your form, you encode it beforehand. So for example, you have a function called encode for HTML content, and then you put it inside. Or here you have encode for JavaScript attribute. And that way, as I said, you need to encode differently for each type of tag, for each different HTML tag, and that does exactly that for you. So the only thing you have to watch out for is to consistently use the encoding and not make the mistake of sometimes just using the user data directly. Uh, yeah, or here JavaScript block. So you, you have basically encoding functions for everything. Attributes, content, JavaScript attributes, JavaScript. Um, this library is, of course, as all OWASP stuff is free and uh, open source, so you can use it if you want. Another one we have is an HTML sanitizer. Um, actually, I'm going to skip this one because the most important one is actually the encoder. Let's see, yeah, skip this. And we have a JSON sanitizer. Who of you uses, does someone of you use JSON? Mm, okay, not so many. One, two, okay. Uh, so yeah, if, if you're using JSON, then this would be a, a good idea to take a look at this. Um, so this, this is the basic kind of, you, you do input validation and output encoding. Most important output encoding. There is another way. And um, this is something recently been developed by the W3C, which is called the Content Security Policy. Has anyone heard of you of this before? Content Security Policy. Okay, that does, that's no problem, because it was just released quite recently. So uh, version 1.0, I think, was released last year, and we are now version 1.1, and I think it's been released now, something around now. What does it do? Um, to some degree, actually, content security policy does the same thing as prepared statement for SQL injection. So in your current browser, uh, the browser just executes every JavaScript he sees. Like, I don't know, 10 years ago, I actually, I was one of these crazy people who thought you could switch off JavaScript and be safe. Try to switch off JavaScript in your web application now. Try to switch off JavaScript in your browser. Uh, the internet experience will be uh, pretty boring, or actually you probably will not see half of the applications on the web. Um, so you can't switch it off anymore, okay? So, but, so that means you have to switch JavaScript on today to actually work. Uh, but if you switch it on, your browser executes every JavaScript it sees, without discrimination, no matter where it comes from. And the idea for content security policy is that your site, your website, uh, has a small text file uh, associated with it. It may be part of the header. And that will declare from where it is safe to use JavaScript. So that means JavaScript will be only executed if it comes from a trusted source. So in, in the best case scenario, you would put all your JavaScript in one directory, and then you would always link to this directory. And you would set this one parameter in the, in the content security policy, and you would say to the browser of your, of your user, you must only execute JavaScript from this one directory, from nowhere else. So that means if I'm an attacker, and I upload JavaScript uh, into your page, this will no longer work. This will no longer run. Um, this is, in theory, this is a beautiful idea. Actually, it's even better than only JavaScript. It also protects for images, objects, like Java objects running in your application, uh, ActiveX, um, fonts, uh, like, like all kinds of sources. 
So this is, in, in theory, this is really nice. Unfortunately, there are still some kinks in the, uh, in the system. And there's one major problem for existing applications. And that is this. So you, because as an attacker, if I upload something, it will always be in line within the HTML page. So that means you must make sure that all your JavaScript is somewhere else. And that is your JavaScript is somewhere in an external, in a, in a directory where no one can upload stuff on you. But then many of your legacy applications will still have inline JavaScript all over the place. So you need to clean that up. Or if you start a new application, it's really, it's really smart to make sure that you don't use inline JavaScript. Uh, a friend of mine did this with their application, and it was, it was quite some work to do, um, but it's possible. It, it just takes effort. Um, but it gives you, for example, as I, I would say for high value situ uh, su systems like banking, financial transactions, e-commerce, uh, this is um, worth considering. Okay? Or for example, if you have an administrative, uh, administration interface, this is worth considering. Um, there's, there's still some problems because um, the browsers have implemented this, so it's, it's available in all your browsers. The only problem is some of the implementation is not perfect. So there are still uh, mistakes in the browsers, like in Internet Explorer, Firefox, and so on. Yep, question. Perfect. Uh, I, I know about the CSP on Firefox, but uh, I didn't know about the CSP on, on, on Chrome. And I'm not sure if the syntax of Firefox and Chrome are different. They use the same syntax, but different, like, they spawn hidden. Uh, so, so this is a header that comes from the server and goes to the client. So the, the, the yeah, actually the header is uh, the same, it's standardized. And in the W3C, uh, there's a working group called Web AppSec Working Group. Um, I'm also a member there, an expert. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the library you showed us before, the, the what are these? The, the, the encoder. Uh, how how frequent it get updated? Because if I update the, the Java version, is this compatible with the, the future version? Yeah. Uh, Actually, this is a very basic library, so it should be compatible with future Java versions, because the, it's only a couple of function calls. It's not much. Um, I'm not guaranteeing. Right? Yeah, okay. Because uh, for, for the developer, yeah. if someone gets out there, we need to change it. Yeah, I understand the, the questions about uh, different Java versions. Yeah. So if you go from version 6 to 7 or whatever, um, will this library still work? I cannot guarantee with my life that it <laughs> shall, but um, it's a fairly simple uh, encoding mechanism. So I think it should still work. Is this a mobile port? Sorry? This is a OWAP project? Yes. And do we need to download and install anything? Uh, it's an OWAP project, and but you just download the library. And that's it. So it, it's, it's a few classes. And Thank you. that's all. And you know, actually, there's one beautiful thing in OWAP. If you see something is not up to date, you can update it yourself. <laughs> and send it back to OWAP. No well, Sorry? No, no chocolate from Omar. You only get chocolate from me, not from Omar, sorry. And that's only because, well, but, but you get the credit. And you can share and you get the, the fun of sharing with your peers, with your friends. Uh, no, it is, it's a view that there is no chocolate for the question. Oh, now I understand. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. That's great. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, no. You might want to. Uh, you're really into chocolate. I mean, you know, you should watch your, um, your health, you know, be careful. You may end up in trouble. Uh, I think you're still slim, so you have no problem. 
Um, good. So this would be how a CSP looks like. It's a little bit um, confusing. <laughs> the beauty is you have it. It can actually be much shorter than this. Okay. I show you the shorter version. This would be a short version. Default source is only from yourself. Then you have some image source where your pictures come from. Script source. This would be the directory from the scripts. And that means only JavaScript from this source will be executed in the browser. Everything else is just data. Will never run as a script. Good. Yeah, as I said, so, so uh, it works in all browsers to answer your question. Uh, the format is standardized. Um, there is still some trouble. So for example, when we did the first kind of sample impl implementations in, in real applications, you know, not like just some game, but real running, um, we found two issues. And then one, one issue we found was sometimes you use Google advertising or, or tracking tools. So there's some interesting Google tracking uh, libraries. If you do that, you may have, you may run into trouble because suddenly you may have to allow content from Google. The problem is if you allow content from Google, everyone can upload content onto Google. So kind of everyone can upload scripts onto Google and then you allow it? Well, that's kind of not really protecting you. Yeah? Because yes, I can't upload it into your application, but I can upload it on, on Google by attacker script. So, so you have to be careful how you use the Google tracking and, and um, statistics. Uh, a second one that we found which was really odd is um, you can actually also disarm like ActiveX and objects. And um, normally that means no Java object, uh, no, no, like applet should work. Um, strangely enough, we tried that and it still worked. And, uh, or Flash, you know, Flash shouldn't work no? if you disable it. I think it is a bug. Uh, yeah, uh, well, what happened is we actually wrote to the, uh, not me, but someone wrote to our working group and said, well, you know what, this is odd, this is working, why? And we, are, we, are we making something wrong? Are we doing something wrong? Are we not getting how, how this is done correctly? And suddenly we found out all the browsers were doing something wrong. Because they were just not implementing this protection mechanism. So they, they were too generous in still continuing running Flash and ActiveX and so on. Um, I believe this is being fixed as we speak or has been fixed already. But it was really odd. So, so this is how, because it's still very young and, and new technology. But if you start writing a new application, I would strongly recommend you to look into making sure that you don't have inline JavaScript and if it's kind of a high value system that you look at content security policy. Uh, yes, Facebook is trying to use that too. Yeah. Um, there's some other stuff, but yeah, this is definitely worthwhile. See time. Actually, yeah, let's play a game before we do uh, before we go lunch because this is still fun. This is not so much for for mobile, but I think for web applications, this is this is kind of a funny part. So imagine you are um, you go into a break. You are maybe you are, do you use Gmail here? Yeah, some people use Gmail. That's good. You have probably a lot of emails in your inbox, or? Yeah, right. Okay. Let's see how we can clean it up. So imagine during the day you are logged into into Gmail, and probably you don't you don't type your password every time. I guess you're gonna be logged in all the day. Yeah. At least I am. So in your lunch break, you think, well, let's play a little game. So you go to this super fun games play now page. Maybe a colleague of yours who really likes you sends that to you. Likes in quotation marks, okay? okay so, um, so you go to this page and you see, okay, I have to select one player, so I have to click here and I have to start the game to try. Let's see what happens. Oh, actually before I do that, I should explain something. In HTML, there's a nice feature, which is you can actually have two pages in front of each other. So it's, uh, let me speak this without the microphone. So you have, you, you load one page, and that's, this is evil.com. 
and you can have, have a frame which is behind it, invisible. But if you click on this one, the click goes through the page on the second one. So if I'm evil.com, I can load behind my own page gmail.com. So to show you, um, this is the first page and behind this is this one. This is your inbox. Maybe you have plenty, maybe you have hundreds of emails here. So, what happens now is, I think, my first click... Sorry, I do this without the microphone. Can you hear me? Okay. My first click is on one player. No, that's okay. No, no, it's okay. So you just see here. My first click is on one player. Select all. My second click is start game. Yes. <laughs> Hooray, you cleaned up your whole inbox. No work to do anymore. All email gone. Great. Yeah, you can... I can go to location. Yes, you can go home. Okay, no need to work. Great. Yeah. And all with just playing one game. Okay, and the game hasn't even started yet. <laughs> so... So the challenge is that these two pages are behind each other, okay? And just, you click on one, but you click, you click on something you don't see. And um, that's called click jacking. Uh, by the way, um, um, a, a good friend of mine, he works for a very large bank, and he's, he, he did run some testing on this, research. And he showed me a really cool um, advanced version of this. Because in this case, you may think, well, you still have to position the pages. Okay? You still think maybe you have to put it right on top of each other, and kind of, this may be difficult. But actually, I've seen the way you can move the page behind this with the mouse. Okay? So that means wherever you click, you click on the right place. Okay? So it's only, you, you just need to click, but wherever you click, it will be the right spot. Because this page is moving with your mouse pointer, okay? So don't worry about the formatting, okay? Actually, I asked him whether he would give me that script, but he said, well, you know what, I can't give you, this is like weaponized. <laughs> I mean, I, I, if I give you this, I mean, he would be responsible for kind of all this trouble, so... Uh, but it was amazing to see this, I mean... Uh, yeah, as I said, for one large bank, they really have to worry about this stuff. So how do you protect against this? Um, it's actually very simple. Uh, there's an HTTP header called X-Frame Options. I'm not sure whether you've heard of that before. Uh, it's just a part of the, the response header, and it basically says you do not allow your page to be framed somewhere else. So this breaks the whole thing. The only thing is, you need to use it, okay? You need to send it out. Um, there are, actually we standardized this, there are three, ver three variations. One is deny, so that means no framing at all. I'm always, I'm, I'm the one page and there's no one else using me. Then there's same origin, which means it's okay if, my, if a page from the same server frames my page. So I'm, you may know like multi-frame, uh, pages, they may use this one. And then there is a third option which is actually not supported by all browsers, where you may allow another page to frame you, but you specify which URL. So for example, if you want to buy some, if you have a shop and you want a link from Amazon to your shop, maybe you allow framing from Amazon. Something like that. So these are three, and yeah, this is um, this is actually now a standard. Uh, there's a second mechanism that you may see sometimes, and that's called frame busting. But I would warn a little bit. This is not 100% safe. So extra extreme options is 100% clear, but frame busting there is a way to intercept this. So frame busting basically does one thing, it has a JavaScript and it checks whether it's the top frame and if, if, if so then it works, if no then it breaks. Um, 
but there's ways to interrupt the script from running. So suddenly, then you don't have the protection anymore. So if you want to protect pro properly, then use extreme options, please. Good. Let's jump to this. Actually, um, I think this is enough with this. Uh, let's see, how is the lunch break? The lunch is ready. The lunch is ready already? Let's see. Yeah, I shall not stand between you and food. I mean, that's a dangerous place to be in. So no, then we have lunch. And uh, we're going to be back in an hour. Uh, I still have some chocolate left, and then we're going to talk about mobile security. Thank you very much, and enjoy your food. <laughs>